do you feel about the... He and Dennis Healy hastily summon colleagues to consider the party's proposals. <laughs> the party traditionally had a meeting of shadow cabinet and national executive, which the manifesto had to be thrashed out. And I went to that meeting thinking, oh, God, we're going to be here all day and much of the night, not looking forward to it. Suddenly, to my astonishment, John Golding, the leader of the hard right, proposes that all these documents should be incorporated into a single manifesto. My gut feeling was to get rid of it as quickly as possible, without any argument, without any dispute. Just take this uh, suicide note, as uh, Gerald Kaufman described it, the longest suicide note in history, put it there, get it signed, and dispatched as quickly as possible. This was carried virtually without any discussion. And afterwards, I remember saying to Golding, what? what sort of manifesto is this? And he said to me, this election is going to be fought on Tony Benn's terms, so we might as well thoroughly incriminate him. We can't win this election, so we might as well hang all his policy around his neck. Now, this indicates the degree of despair to which the Labour Party had come by then. I was still prepared to try and make a decent manifesto out of it, but harder men than I um, wanted to label it as the Ben election so we'd learn our lesson from disaster. A week later, Michael Foote presented Labour's policies at the morning press conference. Gerald Kaufman's tag, the longest suicide note in history, quickly became common currency. It was a huge document covering everything which the Labour government was going to do, written, frankly, from, overwhelmingly, the point of view of the hard left of the Labour Party. So, total unilateral uh, nuclear disarmament, immediate total withdrawal from the common market, abolition of the House of Lords, uh, command economy, siege economy, and so on, plan compulsory planning agreements everywhere. That was all there, and much, much more. I know not at all that the party's uh, position was um, going to lose this in election. I mean, I no doubt about that at all. And that was precisely because we'd allowed a small group of people to determine the agenda of the party who hadn't the faintest notion what was going on in the world out there and who constructed a whole set of policies that were absolutely nothing to do with the needs of real people. And I won my seat in that 1983 election in a strong Labour area, despite our programme, not because of it. We want it to be read up and down the country, and we believe it puts all these different questions in the proper perspective. If we'd won on uh, that election manifesto, we would have had a much better chance of dealing with these economic problems than we had under Thatcher and the Tory government. So I'm not ashamed of that document, and I'm very happy that when discussions of this nature lead people back to look at it. <laughs> what was wrong with that document was that it was a stupid document. It contained a number of extremist things. It contained also utter nonsenses. During the course of the compilation of that document, we only narrowly staved off a proposal that we should have a socialist policy for puppy farms. I kid you not. If the manifesto was a liability, the campaign itself was a disaster. Michael Foote disdained modern electioneering with its gimmicks, its emphasis on sound bites, and the dominance of image. Instead, he entered on an arduous and poorly organized speaking tour of the country. Wherever he went, he carried the baggage of four years of Labour's divisions. It was a hopeless campaign. I have <laughs> memories uh, vividly uh, of uh, the difficulties we were all in. Um, the Labour Party was... Uh, losing votes uh, day after day, you know, support was just sliding away from us. And the reality is that we had tested to destruction uh, the confidence and the uh, trust of our supporters. We were going down part of my constituency on the top of the campaign bus, which was open, and I can remember seeing a man who knew the truth of the polls, which were devastatingly uh, anticipating a, a huge defeat. He knew it, 
we all knew it, and yet here was a man who, who was giving his very all. I mean, he was physically at the limit of everything that he could give, but he knew he was staring defeat in the face. I admired him at that moment, but we all knew he was doomed. The general perception from the outside was that the campaign was very badly run and uh, inept, but I have to say that from the inside it was even worse. The only relief was that uh, from time to time, led by Jim Innes, who was the uh, broadcasting officer, they got hold of the awful uh, Michael Foote tape march uh, and stuck it in the machine and marched around the press office uh, to relieve their tensions. She's going to make a very good member of parliament and of Oi. States according to their constitution. At the heart of Labour's difficulties was the question of defence. Michael Foote was a lifelong unilateralist, utterly committed to ridding Britain of nuclear weapons. The Labour movement are the real defenders of our country. The Labour movement are the people... But during the campaign, the party's divisions over the issue was soon exposed. Oh, it was terrible. One of the problems is that policy wasn't clear. Policy was often damaging, but not clear. There was one day when three different interpretations of Labour's defence policy were given on the very same day by Michael Foote, by Dennis Healy and by John Silkin, who was our defence spokesman. It was utterly uncoordinated. It was a shambles. Every time he'd speak up, their polls would go down. It was clearly an unpopular policy supported by relatively few people, and yet Michael was kept on banging on about it. The only safety for our country, the only defense for our country, the only defense for this country and the other countries is worldwide disarmament, starting with nuclear disarmament. That's what we've got to say. And so his colleagues were saying, Michael, will you please shut up about it? And he said at one point, he said, I am not going to be leader forever of this party. This is uh, the opportunity that I have to get my message across, and I am not going to lose that opportunity to communicate to the British electorate what I think so strongly about this policy. Now, you have to admire that kind of attitude, but as somebody said in the American context, this was a person who'd rather be right than president. Well, Michael clearly would rather be articulate on unilateral nuclear disarmament than Prime Minister. Right now, lads, we're going through, we're going through there. Now, if you're in the way, I'm going to walk you through here. Now, so we can come out of the way. You can get... Michael Foote and the left mistrusted opinion polls. Instead, they favoured rallies, demonstrations, and the power of sustained oratory. I would show uh, Footy the uh, opinion polls and talk to him and say, oh, you're wrong. Said there were a thousand people. At my meeting last night, they all cheered. Let's say, yeah, but there are 122,000 outside saying you're crackers. William Hazlitt, an old friend of mine, said, I think, many, many years ago, before there were any such things as polls, he said, the fear of what the public will think prevents the public from thinking at all. And people do use the fear of what they think the polls are going to say from uh, stopping all kind of thought. Margaret Thatcher and the Conservative Party, in direct contrast to Labour, had no qualms about mimicking the razzmatazz of an American political convention. And her supporters played on Michael Foote's more obvious weaknesses. Let's bomb Russia! Let's kick Michael Foot's stick away! 
we ran a, a very professional campaign. The thing I remember most was cancelling um, the last four days of advertising because um, the, the chairman, Cecil Parkinson, 